Okay, okay, calm down, calm down. Deep breaths. <sighs> look, 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 I love Windows. I did a whole retrospective on Windows XP in it, and I also plan on doing one on Vista, so like and subscribe to see that, and hit the bell icon so you don't miss it. But today, as of right now, Apple is fortunately or unfortunately dominating the laptop market at least. Their benchmarks are blowing other computers out of the water. And it wasn't always like this. For a long time, MacBooks sucked at power tasks, staying cool under lows, or shutting the f up during peak processes. So today, I just want to examine what is that secret sauce that is causing Apple to lead the pack. For now. Look at this MacBook. Looks like just another MacBook, right? But it's not. In fact, it wasn't even called the MacBook. This is the PowerBook, specifically the PowerBook G4, because it was built on the PowerPC G4 chip. This was Apple's first transition to Intel back in 2005. Intel was on top of the game back then, and PowerPC chips, well, they just weren't cutting it. And as Steve Jobs would put it, performance per watt. And things were alright for a while. In fact, they were more than alright. Transition to Intel meant transition to x86, which meant for a brief period in time, your Mac could do everything. Mac OS, Windows, Linux, the whole shebang. But problems were brewing behind the scenes. Intel, extremely comfortable in their position as they virtually had no fight from their immediate rival AMD, was really just working on cruise control, not really innovating, cause they didn't have to. And well, Apple was not happy. If you remember this time with this generation of MacBook Pros, they were notorious for being underpowered, overpriced, extremely hot and loud, and the touch bar didn't help matters. The philosophies just didn't match with Intel's extremely heat-prone CPUs and Apple's sleek, closed designs. However, Apple did have an ace up its sleeve. With the release of the iPhones, Apple had started to gain experience in the mobile device field, specifically with ARM architecture. The first three iPhones featured your run-of-the-mill CPUs made by Samsung or ARM, but that all changed when Apple released the A4 processor. They had started designing their own SoCs, and with the release of iPhone 5S's A6 processor, they started designing their own chips as well. And the benchmarks tell it all. Apple is consistently ahead of their competition. They really got it down when it comes to chip design. And this is when it became clear. Apple is going to transition their whole Mac lineup to ARM. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the secret sauce. Okay, a quick lesson in instruction sets if you haven't seen the previous video. So you know that we code, right? Like system.out.println or if else statements. But you must have heard that computers understand ones and zeros. So how does that work? Well, basically, when you code, it gets converted into this intermediate form, which we call machine code. It's basically instructions like move this register value, do this, go here, jump here, and so on. Basically, a lot more processing that is oblivious to you because you code in this human readable form. Like, take this example. This is quite easy to think about, right? Like, if this is true, do that, or else do that. But the machine code is far more interesting, doing a lot more stuff like read this register value, move here, so on and so forth. And these instruction sets, in this case, it's x86, in this case, it's PowerPC, and in this case, it's ARM. It's basically like another language you speak, right? Like the syntax or words you use are different. Like someone who speaks PowerPC jargon isn't going to be understood by someone who speaks ARM. And when you compile, let's say C++, what is that compiling doing? It's basically converting all this crap that you've written into the correct machine code, whether that be x86, ARM, or PowerPC. Just a quick side note, what Rosetta is doing is taking x86 machine code which was written for Intel Macs and converting it to ARM so that your M1 or M2 Macs can understand it. And since it's like a language, or really a set of rules, your CPU is really designed around this machine code or instruction sets. Which is why sometimes instruction sets or machine codes are also called the computer architecture. And Apple has switched from x86 to ARM. Okay, there's a lot of reasons why Apple's chips are faster. There's too many to cover, and too many that even I find hard to understand. So I'm gonna go through some that are simple enough for me to explain. The first is system on a chip, or SOC. Everything like the CPU, the GPU, the memory is all on one die. And even at literal lightning speeds, distances like these matter. Closer means faster. Another important advantage is that the CPU and the GPU share the same RAM. A lot of times your big ass gaming PCs have a CPU and a separate GPU, and while that's great for heat management, it also means a lot of times data has to be copied from the CPU RAM to the GPU RAM, and that costs precious time. The great part about sharing memory is that there is no copying business, you just access the memory, whether that be the CPU or the GPU. Another major reason for Apple's speed is that they're the ones who designed the software and they're the ones who designed the hardware. 
Mac OS is probably purpose built on a very low level to take maximum advantage of the M1 or the M2 chips. This is a privilege that Windows x86 PCs just do not have, as they're designed to run on all these configurations and processors. Okay, this last reason might be a little more complicated, but stick around and hopefully I can simplify it. It really might be a case of RISC versus CISC. Okay, okay, it's really not that complicated. RISC stands for Reduce Instruction Set Computers, while CISC stands for Complex Instruction Set Computers. Reduced instruction set computers, as you can guess, have a reduced amount of instructions, while complex instruction set computers have a lot of instructions. Think of it as risk type languages having very few words to describe things, while CISC type languages having a lot of words to very specifically describe every unique thing. ARM is a reduced instruction set computer language, while x86 is a complex instruction set computer language. Let's take a simple example, and this is not exactly accurate, but let's say you want to multiply A and B. In CISC type languages, you might just go multiply A and B, and you're done. But in RISC type languages where there aren't a lot of instructions, there might not be one specifically for multiplication. So you'd probably have to go something like add A, add A, add A, B times. Reduce instruction sets, ironically, increase the number of instructions you have to give because there's so few for specificity. But see, the problem with having complex instructions in sys type languages is that they take a long time to execute. So you know that your CPU has a frequency, right? Like gigahertz. That's basically how many clock cycles per second your CPU can run. In sys type architectures, some complex instructions can take 3, 4, 5, 12 cycles is still running this line of code. But your CPU has a lot of departments working. And the idea is, if this department is idle while these guys are still working on that super complex instruction, the idea is you go and fetch this completely unrelated line of instructions and get these idle departments working as well. You might have heard this term. It's called multi-threading, and it is essential for efficiency. After all, all these departments chilling is just time wasted. That is you getting frustrated as to why your PC is so goddamn slow. But see, multi-threading is just a quick fix to an inherent problem in sys-type architectures. Because these instructions are so nuanced for every little thing, some instructions just take too goddamn long. Compare that to risk type architectures like ARM. They have very few words in their dictionary, so all of them are quite simple. And all of them, by design, take one clock cycle to finish. This simple design just makes them more efficient. There's no these departments are working and then these departments are idle so we have to get these departments working and then take these results and process the next step. No, it's one clock cycle, one instruction. That's it. Cisc was really made to increase efficiency in memory rather than computing. After all, saying MULT ABC takes up a lot less space than saying add A, B times, take that result, add that, C times, and so on. Back in the day, memory was quite expensive, so we had to be careful with our memory usage. But these days, bro, we got memory for days. So what if we have a few more lines of instructions taking up a few more bytes of memory? As long as the CPU is faster, we don't care. Okay, there's a few, a lot more reasons like risk type architectures having to do more work in the compiler stage and sys type architectures having more architecturally complex things. It's a whole subject that we simply don't have the time to dive into. Okay, that last reason was kind of complicated. Feel free to rewind and rewatch it again. It is a little more complicated than that, but I didn't go through all the detail because we'd be here forever, and it'd make it even harder to understand. There are some situations where I don't think x86 is going anywhere, at least for a while. Windows is pretty much built on x86, and while Apple is squeezing every last bit of efficiency from their hardware, if you've used Macs for a while, you might have noticed that they're not very backwards compatible. I mean, just a few updates and your older programs start malfunctioning or straight up stop launching. On the contrary, Windows is actually pretty good with backwards compatibility. A lot of old programs work perfectly fine on Windows 10, and it's actually quite a blessing because you don't have to downgrade OS's or keep other OS's handy because it's just software. There are pros and cons to each side. I daily drive this MacBook Pro, but I always have a bunch of Windows computers on standby because you'll never know when you need them. So this isn't about hating on Windows or Intel, it's more of to each their own.